Okay, so chapter 5, a new right, 1933 to 1935. So what's important to note is that Hitler became Chancellor of Germany on the 30th of January 1933. This was known as the seizure of power. Hitler had been successful um, because he had been helped into power by the conservative elites, um, including that of um, Franz von Papen, Vice Chancellor from the Centre Party. They believed that Hitler was weak and they believed that Hitler could be controlled, much like a puppet. And they hoped to be able to use Nazi Party's popularity in order to achieve their own political goals, ultimately before ousting Hitler and then imposing a conservative and militaristic style of government. That's what they hoped to do. Although it's important to note that although the Nazis were popular in the November 1932 elections, the Nazis had actually seen their vote decline from 37% to 33%. Nazis hated the Weimar Republic. They felt it was weak. And they weren't wrong in their belief because between 1919 and 1930, 1933, there had already been the space of 14 chances in only 14 years with Hitler being appointed the 15th. These are some um, key terms I think are important to address. Um, so Gleitschultang is the idea of coordination, uh, switching on and bringing into line this idea of um, Nazification and using policies uh, to, to impose what the Nazis wanted in society. So organisations essentially become Nazified. SA are the stormtroopers. They are led by Ernest Rom, and they are a paramilitary organisation used by Hitler in 1921. Their sole purpose is basically to defend Nazi party rallies and meeting, meetings and also uh, break, up the, break up political activity of the Nazis' political opponents. The SS were Hitler's personal bodyguard led by Heinrich Himmler, and the ESD were led by Reinhard Heydrich, who was um, Himmler's right-hand man. Um, Stadthelm were known as Steel Helmets, and they were formed in 1918. Um, and these young men and uh, war veterans from the First World War basically opposed any forms of democracy, so most closely associated with the Weimar Republic. These Stadthelm or Steel Helmets had basically wanted uh, to impose some form of fascism. They, didn't, they did not necessarily agree with Nazism. However, once the Nazis had consolidated their power with Hitler becoming Chancellor in 1933, um, they felt increasingly pressured to conform to the Nazis. So by 1934, they did conform, and they, the Stadtholm changed their name to the League of National Socialist Frontline Fighters. Um, Hitler managed to cement a totalitarian dictatorship with really only the space of a few months of his chancellorship in 1934, uh, the president Paul von Hindenburg died in August, um, and the dictatorship of, under Hitler lasts for 12 years, from 1933 until 1945, which is the end of the Second World War. And they are able to impose this dictatorship due to four main factors. So the violence that can be associated with the SS and the more radical SA, uh, propaganda, um, we, we can see this with uh, Dr. Joseph Goebbels, who was appointed uh, Minister of Pop popular enlightenment and propaganda in 1933 and pseudo legal methods so the pseudo legal methods would be through um sort of through legislation so this can be seen with the enabling act or any forms of legislation perhaps uh with racial hatred directed towards the jews where you see um uh, the civil service law being introduced in april um, and also another example is Gleis Schultang, which we discussed uh, just a minute ago, and Gleis Schultang is just bringing into line. Um, a good example of Gleis Schultang can be seen with Goering's control of the Prussian police force. Um, and this was because, although Goering um, was in charge of the Prussian police force, um, there was a special police which consisted of the SS, SA and Stadthelm, who were being used as this special police. So it's sort of an auxiliary police to help regulate and work with the Prussian police. So basically, the special police of the SS, SA and Stato, uh, um basically assists uh, the Prussian police force, police force, and that is to help keep order following the Reichstag fire. A new law was passed in February 1933, and that banned any newspaper from speaking ill of the new uh, regime under Adolf Hitler. So now, Hitler basically led a legal revolution, uh, in a sense. Okay, so the next event we're going to look at is the Reichstag fire. So I've given you the basis of what, what's happening. Um, so the Reichstag fire takes place on the 27th of February 1933. So that's not that long after Hitler has consolidated 
uh, power-wise Chancellor of Germany. Um, and the Reichstag fire is caused by a Dutch communist, Martinus van der Loop, who's arrested for burning down the Reichstag. This is a perfect opportunity uh, for Hitler, as he's able to persuade President Hindenburg at the time to use Article 48. Now, Article 48 is, um, was only used under the Weimar Republic, which is, can be used by the president in any forms of emergency. So this is a perfect example of when Article 48 has been used. And a state of emergency is proclaimed in this situation of the fire. Then we see the passing of the Reichstag fire decrees, which sees the suspension of the freedom of speech and also the rights to protest. And the German scholar Karl Breda uh, calls this basically a legal revolution. Why is it legal? Well, because you see Hitler is able to manage to persuade Hindenburg to use Article 48 and also pass the Reichstag fire decrees. So it basically stops any form of, uh, as I said, speech and protest with the Reichstag fire decrees. And the first concentration camp, uh, if you notice, would be set up in Dachau uh, to deal with political opponents. Um, and by summer 1933, nearly 30,000 people had been taken into protective custody without trial or the right to appeal. And pres prisoners in Dachau were expected to commit themselves to hard labour. Following the Reichstag fire, Hitler had called for 5th of March elections 1933, Nazis hoped to be able to use this, the press to create the illusion that the Nazis were the only political party in Germany to be able to save uh, Germany from a communist takeover or revolution. Hitler had observed what had happened in Russia uh, in 1917 with Lenin and the Russian Revolution and feared that there was going to be this communist hysteria that was going to break out in the rest of the Western world. Although the Nazis failed to gain a majority or in the 5th of March 1933 election as they only managed to cure, 44% of the vote um, is the case. Um, now, the Reichstag fire itself, Nazis believe that Van der Lue did not actually start the fire alone. They believe that four other communists were also responsible and they were arrested and tried. However, only Van der Lue could be, Martinus Van der Lue could be found guilty, so he was thus executed. And people like Georgi Dimitrov, who was a communist, managed to get off. The Nazis felt this was more now, OK, right, it's more important to get serious on legislation and courts. So they imposed these special people courts. And these special people courts in 1934 used to deal with tackling political opposition. So there are many different interpretations uh, from historians about who started the fire. Historians like Kershaw believe that Lube started the fire on his own. Uh, as close sources to Hitler revealed, the Nazis were in panic and felt the fire was the start of a communist revolution. Meanwhile, a book in the UK, published in 1934, claimed the Nazis were responsible due to the speed of the fire and the convenience. The reason why it would have been convenient for the Nazis to have actually been responsible for the Reichstag fire was the fact that they wanted to see the destruction of socialists and any form of communists. So it made perfect sense to um, create the idea that um, a communist had burnt down the Reichstag because it was going to change public opinion and people were going to believe that um, the communists were not good people. And, and thus the support for Hitler's Nazi party would increase. That's what perhaps the book is trying to imply there. Now we're going to look at examples of Gleis Schultang. Gleis Schultang is again is bringing into line coordination or switching on, whichever term you prefer. Um, so examples of this can be seen with, as I said earlier, uh, Joseph Goebbels who becomes the Minister of Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda, or the Propaganda Minister, and he has complete control over German media, so this involves your press, your radio, your films. This is a perfect opportunity for Goebbels to restrict any opposing voices to the regime. And Goebbels also takes centre of German art, culture, and things like architecture, and left-wing newspapers are banned across Germany. Um, other examples uh, can be seen with Jews and political opponents being removed from their positions within the judiciary, and these, what happens is professional Nazi organisations were set up. So again, it's this Nazification. Organisations that exist in Germany are now being are conforming to this Gleichschultang, where these organisations are becoming Nazified. So it's the Reichstag, the Reichstag Nazi organisations. And if people were not part of these organisations, they would look as if they were opposed to the, to the regime. So many Germans felt the need to be part of them. And it was interesting to point out that many Germans actually agreed with the Nazi policies uh, to begin with because they uh, believed that communism and socialism was a threat to society and thus needed to be destroyed. Um, so on from this, uh, following the Reichstag fire and the 5th of March elections, and the Nazis still did not secure a majority, 
even with the coalition of other right-wing nationalist party, they still only managed to secure 52% of the Reichstag seats. And Hitler didn't have that two-thirds majority um, yet. And he needed that two-thirds majority. And why, why did he need a two-thirds majority? It was so Hitler would be able to alter the constitution for them to fire. Therefore, he had to try and gain support amongst Hindenburg. Uh, a good example of how Hitler managed to gain support from Hindenburg was through a day of national uprising, or in other words, uh, the Potsdam, uh, the day of Potsdam, uh, where basically Goebbels used the opening of a new Reichstag at Potsdam on 21st of March 1933 to, to try to win over the support of Hindenburg. And the event was stage managed by Goebbels. Hitler wore black attire and used this as a perfect opportunity to deliver a monologue outside of the tomb of Frederick the Great, where he spoke of his respect and gratitude um, towards President Hindenburg. And basically how this idea of the young were going to unite with the old unanimously. The enabling act after the Reichstag had uh, been reopened, uh, the debate took place with the enabling act. Now you have many KPD, many, the members of the KPD are in camps or left the country, so this poses no political opposition. So the KPD are ruled out of the enabling net vote. Um, the SPD themselves um, consisted of 94 out of 120 members who had one season in the Reichstag who actually made a debate. And the SPD leader Otto Wells tried to speak against the enabling net, although unfortunately he was handed down with, uh, by many SA men who had shouted, we want the enabling net so they'll be held to pay. So Wells didn't really get much of a say in that situation. Meanwhile, the Centre Party, uh, so Fred von Papen, the Vice Chancellor, had supported the enabling act very strongly, along with the rest of his cronies within the Centre Party, as they feared that if they did not accept this piece of legislation, what the political consequences would be. And they hoped with the legislation and act being passed that Hindenburg would op um, hopefully be able to control and constrain Hitler. The enabling act was initially um, meant to give Hitler unprecedented, unprecedented powers for just four years, with the act being passed 441 votes to 94. The textbook is wrong, it says 444. The enabling act meant the Reichstag ultimately lost its significance, so it was just a mere body for Hitler's political speeches. And it, this also saw the abolishment of the powers of the land of legisl legislatures. Okay, so after the Reichstag fire and the passing of the enabling act, we see the Copernic Blood Week. Uh, so not that long after the enabling had been passed, all political opposition had been disbanded. So it meant that the Nazis um, now had got rid of all political opposition, and this allowed them to consolidate their power. And how did Copernic Blood Week come to occur then? Well, there was an SPD member called Anton Schmaus, who happened to resist being arrested or refuse, and as a result shot down three SA members. The Nazis thought, well, this is unfair, we need to respond with a greater amount of belligerence. So as a result, 500 SPD members were tortured by SA, SS, Gestapo uh, members. And as a result, 23 of these SPD members died. And the Copernic Blood Week took place on the 21st to the 26th of June, 1933. The outcome of this Copernic Blood Week was we saw uh, the dissolution of the SPD, with many SPD members fleeing to Prague and forming the SOPAGE, which is the SPD in exile. The DNVP um, were absorbed into the Nazis uh, following its leader, Alfred Hugenberg's resignation. Initially, when Hitler became Chancellor, Hugenberg and Papin had hoped that they would be able to control Hitler, although how wrong they were. Um, history gives us very good hindsight. Um, and now, following all the political opposition being disbanded, we still had the issue of the Centre Party. Um, the Concordat was signed between Hitler and the Pope, where the Nazis promised to respect Catholic institutions if in Germany, as long as they didn't interfere in political activity. The Concordat was signed on the 20th of July, 1933, and this weakened the Concordat, weakened the Centre Party. Um, so the Centre Party dissolved themselves, and on the 14th of July, 1933, the Nazi Party were the only legal party within Germany. Um, following the signing of the Concordat on the 20th of July, 1933, the Concordat saw the destruction of the most popular Christian trade union, whilst other socialist trade unions were belligerently destroyed. Examples of Gleis Schultang, uh, trade unions were replaced by Nazi organisations, the German Labour Front, the DAF, led by Dr. Robert Lee. Um, now, the establishment of the DAF. All independent labour unions in Germany were outlawed. The purpose of the DAF basically controlled workers, silenced opposition. 
The DAF provided an advantage to industrial bosses who could increase hours and also implement wage freezes which workers had to accept. In Weimar Germany, trade unions were initially set up to defend workers' rights and demand better pay. This is a mere juxtaposition of what's going on in Nazi Germany. The leader of the DAF, or the German Labour Front, Dr. Robert Lee, said, you know, you know, in our city, you need to you need to sort of impose some form of workers' organisation that says many workers don't trust you, and we need to prevent opposition growing. Nazis take that on board, and they think, okay, we need to prove that we can be of some benefit to German workers, and maintain their support. The beauty of labour program is introduced. There's, the beauty of labour focuses on improving working conditions for workers. Propaganda posters, for example, detailed good ventilation in the workplace. So, okay, workers are going to have very good ventilation. That's a positive. Another organisation can be seen with the Strength Through Joy programme. So, people would be um, rewarded for their hard work, whilst their wages did not increase. And as a result of this, they would be able to go on excursions on cruise ships, uh, go to the People's Theatre, or get the People's Car, a Volkswagen. One of the propaganda posters said, save five marks a week and get your own car. Um, as a result, DA membership grew to 22 million and to enhance worker productivity, Dr. Lee awarded efficiency medals uh, to encourage um, hard work. Ways the DAF did protect workers' rights are important to note. So when Hitler focused on rearmament and preparing for war, when Hermann Göring had been in, became planning potionary of the four-year plan in 1936, Nazis decided they wanted to prioritise German industry, whilst the DAF opposed any attempts by the Nazis to restrict the wages of workers. Nazis agreed with Lee as working class support was important to their power, as Robert Lee believed that their opposition as the DAF to this idea of, from the Nazis would prevent increased worker opposition. Um, and in, worker opposition would be shown merely only through uh, low productivity. So that's how trade unions um, took place. So you have trade unions being outlawed, and you have the DAF, which is under the idea of Gleich Schultang, of this German labour front being imposed by Dr. Lee. That is what happens, and you see the dismantling of uh, the Centre Party through the Concordat and other Christian trade unions. The next topic we're going to discuss is the impact of the Nine of the Long Knives. Um, so the SA used violence, were well, known as basically using any forms of violence against the Nazi's political opponents, and they were led by Ernest Rom. The SA had been essential for helping Hitler become Chancellor as they weakened political opponents such as the KPD and the SPD. Yet the SA are also known as the Brown Shirts. The SA initially expected to be rewarded for all the efforts and sacrifices made in the 1920s, for example, with the Beer Hall Putsch or Munich Putsch, which took place in 1923 in November, or through the 1930s, when Hitler's dictatorship was implemented, that is, when they hoped they would be rewarded. They also expected Nazi revolution to go much further, with the SA hoping to play a role in the military in terms of controlling it. The SA also embraced the anti-capitalist aspects of the 25-point programme and called on Hitler to demand for greater economic reform. Hitler was more determined to maintain the support of the wealthy industrialists at that time, as his economic plan was being headed by Dr. Hadelman Schack, um, and Hitler was more focused on getting the economy uh, going, first of all, and, and trying to sort out the mass unemployment that had been incurred following the Great Depression uh, that had um, taken place in 1929. SA violence had been particularly unpopular uh, within Germany, particularly amongst the middle class, and the thing is now that all political opposition had been disbanded following the Reichstag fire on 27 February 1933, um, all political parties had been banned, so there was no need or justification for violence from the SA to crack down on political opponents. It's also important to note that although the SA wanted the Nazi revolution to go much further with the second revolution, Hitler didn't want a second revolution. And the reason he didn't want a second revolution was he was happy to make use of the traditional powers of German society to achieve his goals. And he was wary that the SA violence was particularly disliked amongst um, many Germans and he didn't want to lose support amongst the German people. The military themselves absolutely despised the SA. They saw him as violent street thugs, and the SA didn't like the military. They wanted to take control of the military and assert a people's militia, hence a people's army. The SA at that time consisted of two million men, while the army only had a, Germany's army was only had about a hundred thousand men. The reason why they only had a hundred thousand men 
was due to the fact that they were limited due to the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. The fact that Germany could not have an army any bigger than that of having an army composed of 100,000 men. Hitler saw the military as crucial in his political goals. Hitler hoped to be president, but in order for this to occur, he had to basically reassure the military and Hindenburg that he would respect the power of the Junkers and leave the military essentially unreformed. There was growing opposition from the conservative right, particularly amongst Edgar Jung and Papen, who wanted to impose a monarchy once Hindenburg would die. And there were also calls coming from Rome for a second revolution. By 1934, uh, Papin spoke at Marburg University, criticising calls from Rome for a second revolution, and the head of the military, Werner von Blumberg, threatened Hitler to impose, threatened Hitler by saying, I'm going to impose military control over Germany if you Nazis cannot control the disorder and chaos of the SA. It didn't help. Matters were made worse when Hitler and Goering, who absolutely hated Rom, uh, created false allegations that uh, Rom was planning to take over government against Hitler's will. Therefore, Hitler orchestrated the Night of Among Knives on the 30th of June 1934. 200 key SA members were executed and 100 political opponents were also murdered. Uh, notable politicians to point out who had been murdered were Edgar Jung, Gregor Strasser, um, Ernest Rom, the leader of the SA, uh, Kurt von Slicer, who was the ex-chancellor of Germany, and Gustav von Kahr, the guy who had actually sabotaged the beer Paul Putsch or Munich Putsch in 1923. Papin was also arrested, intimidated, and this was to silence him. The, end, the event of the Night of the Long Knives um, crushed all the threat from the conservative right, and the Night of the Long Knives was particularly popular with the military as the SA were destroyed. When Hindenburg died, Hitler became declared, became Führer. Führer meant that Hitler had the combined roles of Chancellor and President, combined under one umbrella. On the 20th of August 1934, the army imposed a new oath called the Hitler Oath, which meant that all soldiers were expected to swear an oath of loyalty to Hitler. It was interesting how a night of, my, night of long knives was a belligerent event, and the next day Hitler hosted a tea party. Um, it's quite a mere juxtaposition of his character, uh, essentially. Okay, so now I'm going to move on. So we're looking at the coordination of regional and local governments. So the biggest challenge facing Hitler uh, during his time as Führer was the judiciary and local and state institutions. But what had actually helped Hitler was the events that have actually happened under Papin uh, before Hitler took over uh, the chancellorship in 1933 and before he became um, Führer in 1934. The previous chancellor, uh, Franz von Papin had actually overthrown the Prussian Socialist Centre Party coalition government in 1932. This action was known as a Prussian coup d'etat, as the Prussian Socialist Centre Party coalition government was seen as being unable to control the violence between the SA and the communists in the state. Hence, a state of emergency was called where the Chancellor would be able to interfere, as Article 48 had been used. Although Papin had actually hoped to see the destruction of the SPD's power base in Prussia, hoping this would gain in favour amongst right wing. Uh, Germans in the lead up to the July 1932 elections, this goal failed. Goering was appointed Vice Commissioner for the Prussian Ministry of the Interior and ultimately used this position to control the Prussian police. This position also enabled the Nazis to reinforce the Prussian police with 50,000 SA, SS and Statel members recruited as special police to terrorise opponents in a legal manner. The Nazis were able to make use of Article 2 of the Reichstag fire decrees and the Prussian coup d'etat which allowed the Nazi state control of any state that cannot control law or order. The Nazi party were able to replace the governments of Baden, Saxony, Bavaria with their own Reich commissioners and the law from the coordination of Alamba. This basically allowed the Nazi governors, known as uh, Gulliters, to implement laws and administer their state without consulting any forms of state parliament. The law for reconstruction of the Reich was imposed in 1934 and this law ended all state parliaments, abolished the upper house known as the Reichstag, which had been created under the Weimar constitution which represented all state assemblies. Germany was also divided up into 30 gals. Each gal was led by a Gulletier, a district leader. As a result, policies had become much more centralised and the Gulletier of Berlin was Goebbels. Also, is, is another important factor to mention is that there were 400,000 block wardens who were added in an addition and they monitored the neighbourhoods in order to spot for any forms of signs of deviancy. So that's the coordination of regional and local government. Now we're going to observe Hitler's style of government. To what extent was Hitler a dictator by 1935? Sebastian 
Hafner believed Hitler ruled by chaos. Hitler's government was not centralized, but instead it was chaotic and had no sense of direction. In 1933, Hitler did not have any forms of interest in designing legislation, so he left that role to his ministers to draft new legislation and then discuss with other ministers. So legislation would be then redrafted and then presented to Hitler for him to sign into law or reject. First of all, we're going to discuss the intentionalist argument, which is the idea that Hitler was a strong dictator. Norman Richer, historian, has suggest, suggested in a quotes, Hitler was master in the Third Reich, unquote. Uh, Hitler made all the big decisions. He took the strategic decisions in regards to the Jewish problem and foreign policy. We had this hierarchical system with Hitler at the top and delegating tasks to his subordinates. The criticism of this idea is that it's far too simplistic and there's a polyocracy, um, which the idea of a polyocracy is when you have more than one, uh, more than one person ruling, essentially. You have tons of ministers, although Hitler is actually at the top of that hierarchical system. Hitler ruled through what is described as the Machiavellian policy of divine and rule, um, where there's basically competitions between different government departments. We can see this in policing between 33 and 36 with uh, Wilhelm Frick, the Minister of the Interior, and also him, the leader of the SS. Um, examples of how Hitler was a strong dictator and made all the big decisions, for example, his orchestration of the Night of the Long Knives on the 30th of June 1934, which we've just covered, where Hitler acted alone and it led to the destruction of the SA and the so-called need for a second revolution. Another example can be seen with Hitler withdrawing from the League of Nations and his, um, him securing the Anglo-German Naval Agreement in 1935 and compulsory conscription in that same year, which undermined the terms of the Treaty of the site. The structuralist and revisionist interpretation, which is the idea that Hitler was a weak dictator, um, this can mostly be seen because of the fact that Hitler didn't really take much interest in day-to-day -day government. Um, he lived a bohemian lifestyle, he rose at midday, there was this idea that the light would never be out in the Fuhrer's office, but it was actually quite the opposite, rise in midday, and have many meetings, um, and often go to bed late in the evening. He spent most of his time away from the capital of Berlin, at his home in the Bavarian Alps, and there were rivalries between different government departments who were all trying to impress Hitler. Nazis put forward the idea that the Fuhrer could never be wrong, so it was impossible to admit when legislation had actually failed to achieve its goals. Hitler was known for disliking the idea of reading paperwork. He couldn't read any forms of paperwork that were more than 20 pages long. So verbal agreements were often used, known as the Fuhrer's Orders. Uh, cabinet meetings in 1933 took place 75 times, but this deduced uh, after his chancellorship by 1935, the cabinet meetings occurred 12 times. It was very rare for Hitler to initiate any forms of action, so his organisation was chaotic. And historians such as Brosnat and Monckton claimed that the anarchic system controlled Hitler rather than he controlled it. And the historian Monckton suggests Hitler was a weak dictator, uh, weak dictator in quotes, as he took few decisions. The Fuhrer's will is an idea uh, presented by Kershaw. The Nazis achieved their political goals. Um, this is a separate idea of the Fuhrer's will with um, Ian Kershaw. Nazis were able to achieve their political goals as they were united in their loyalty to Hitler. Nazis were encouraged to use this book of Mein Kampf and Hitler's speeches in order to form legislation, in order to fulfill Hitler's goals. Hitler favoured ministers such as Goebbels, Himmler and Goering, who could gain personal meetings with the Fuhrer to present legislation. On the other hand, many ministers uh, within a Nazi party would have to go to the head of Reich Chancellor, led by, led by Hans Heinrich Lehmers, and it had to gain favour amongst Lehmers in order for legislation to be approved by Hitler in the first place. Kershaw's model is accepted, in which all were working towards the Fuhrer. Hitler had a supreme role, um, and all those below him were attempting to interpret his worldview of Ortunschung. Um, another idea is the idea of cognitive radicalisation. Hitler favoured legislation that was extreme, and competition between different government departments became more and more extreme as they tried to outdo one another. Who could implement the policies that they were most radical? Um, his, that's what historians describe as cognitive radicalization. An example where different Nazi leaders tried to impress Hitler can be seen in the ideas of Nazi policies and legislation directed towards the Jewish um, minority as they wanted to fulfill the will of the Fuhrer. Uh, for example, Julius Streicher orchestrated the one day boycott for Jewish businesses on the 1st of April 1933. Wilhelm Frick, the Minister of the Interior, imposed an Aryan clause in the civil service law. Of 1933, and actually 37,000 Jews left Germany in 1933, including Einstein. Uh, in 1935, 
The Nuremberg Laws were introduced following Gerhard Wagner's uh, hint. Uh, 1938 Crystal Knack was orchestrated by the SS. Newspapers such as the Angry from 1935 were edited by Goebbels as well, which was anti-Semitic. Um, and then we're going to be covering parts of Hitler's government. We're going to look at the decline of cabinet meetings. So Hitler's first cabinet consisted of a coalition because Hitler, when he became, uh, before becoming Chancellor, was in a coalition government, and there were two only there were only two other Nazi members within that cabinet of twelve, um, with Wilhelm Freak and Gore, Goering uh, being another one. So before becoming Chancellor, he had to maintain the support of the other politicians. Cabinet meetings occurred up until January 1933, and Hitler would not allow the cabinet to vote on legislation. Instead, Hitler would do that himself. Thus, he named that week in the cabinet more. And as I said, cabinet meetings took place 75 times in 1933, and then 12 times by 1935. So at the meetings, it would be rare for Hitler to actually be present. So as the decline of cabinet meetings, the relations with the army. Hitler orchestrated the Night of Long Knives as they were seen as the biggest threat to the German uh, military. Um, Hitler wanted to take back land that Germany lost during the First World War, and he was actually inspired by his history teacher, Leopold Putsch, to call for his way to pan Germany, the idea that Germany and Austria should become one. Um, this, this feeds into the idea of Lebensraum, the idea of the expansion of territory. In order to achieve these goals, though, Hitler needed the support of the military. And there were disagreements between Rom over whether to assert a people's militia. As we said earlier, that led to the night of the Long Knives. And after that, Hindenburg died, and the army imposed the Hitler Oath, which meant all soldiers had to swear an oath of loyalty to the Fuhrer. Uh, but military chiefs were really peed off by this because they had not been consulted by these changes. And Hitler also focused on weakening the military traditional political influence within politics. Also, with relations to the army, as a result, over time, the army leaders started to become more subservient to Hitler. And Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, was allowed by Hitler to set up SS regiments to control concentration camps. Under the command of Sepp Dietrich, the order of death's head reached 2,000 men by the end of 1934. And the extent of Hitler's power, the Nazis were dependent on the media, so their worldview would be imposed across Germany. So, what are the strengths of Hitler's power? He was seen as the most powerful leader that there had ever been in Germany since 1871 with Bismarck. Hitler did not believe in his system of law. He believed that he was above the law. Hitler didn't even feel the need to consult with leaders of the military before making decisions relating to the army. What are the reasons that Hitler's power was limited? Hitler favoured ministers such as Himmler and Goebbels who were able to develop their own power bases within the Nazi party. Hitler didn't completely impose his leadership or assert it over the German military. And the Gulliteers were considerably independent and would often oppose legislation coming from central government if they felt it infringed upon their powers. So that's the limitations of Hitler's power. How successful was the Nazis' attempts to create a Volksgemeinschaft uh, between 1933 and 1935? Well, first we have to look at the relations between the state and the party. It's interesting to point out that Hitler did not actually allow the Nazis to take control over the state. State institutions and ministries such as education, economy and transport for example, remained. Uh, Dr. Hadjiman Schack was Minister of Economics in key figure and dominated the state institution of the economy from 34 to 37 uh, up until his resignation. And Robert Lee was unable to influence economic affairs. Gulliteers were independent institutions, so it often clashed with the Minister of the Interior, Frick, who found it difficult to control these regional Nazi leaders. The police and the army, judiciary and civil service were opposed to Jews and political opponents, and the Nazis controlled these organisations. In addition, Hitler supported a system of dualism, hence it was not clear who was in charge, as the government party were in competition with one another. Historian Richard Kershaw argued that a chaotic system of dualism actually strengthened Hitler's power. Um, examples of this idea of dualism. Um, in 1933, Hitler created a new party institution to manage the construction of the autobahns. Organisation Tot, led by Fritz Tot, opposed to using the Ministry of Transport. Another example can be seen with the police. The SS, SA and Sta uh, Statelm were brought into the Prussian police force and between 1933 and 1936 the Minister of the Interior and Himmler clashed over whether the party or whether the state had control over the police. Although by 1936 the SS, led by Heinrich Himmler, was put in charge of the police. Another example is it's important for Hitler to maintain, in terms of the economy, maintain the support of the wealthy industrialists in his early days. So Dr. Hadamun Schack initially had been appointed in charge of the economic plan. 
But by 1936, there had been disagreements with Hadjiman Shaikh and Hitler wrote for MIFO bills and uh, Hermann Goering headed the four-year plan as plenary by 1936 and that was a new party institution to control the economy. Attempts to create a Volksgemeinschaft, Nazis wanted to implement a Volksgemeinschaft, a people's community as a way to unite German society under one communal body. This is the only form of socialism seen under the Nazis and they would often use propaganda as a way to, for the Nazis to impose Volksgemeinschaft, accusing politicians for portraying Germans with the defeat of the First World War and the stab of the back theory and myth and the weakness of the Weimar Republic's constitutional government in comparison to Hitler's strong government. So who could be part of the Volksgemeinschaft? Only those who were defined as true Germans or Aryans, uh, whilst communists and Jews were seen as a threat to unity and they were excluded from the Volksgemeinschaft. One of the strengths of Volksgemeinschaft was that the concept was so vague that um, it was never necessarily clear how you would interpret it. And Hitler was appealing to many Germans because even if you did not agree with all elements of the Volksgemeinschaft, there was something for everybody and the main aim was really to unite around the Führer. For example, different Germans wanted different things. The Catholics and Protestant churches, for example, wanted their movement against ca uh, communism. The military and big business favoured the idea of a dictatorship opposed to democracy. Um, Others basically were happy that Hitler had opposed the Treaty of Versailles and wanted to leave from the League of Nations. And <coughs> the Volksgemeinschaft was used as a way of being able to assert who was actually a citizen or not. As it proclaimed in the 25 point programme, only members of the Volk may be citizens of the state is an example used. So the conclusion of Volksgemeinschaft focused on consent, hence it united Germans in their support for the Nazis. But, in different, but for different reasons. Support and devotion to the Fuhrer was seen as a reason um, basically to be united and belief in Germany was represented through belief through Hitler. Um, Volksgemeinschaft was basically the idea of Volkisch thought 18th century rom romanticism which laid the foundations for Volksgemeinschaft. The themes of blood and soil were deployed and attempts to create the strength, attempt to define the idea of social Darwinism and strength of the Herrenbog, which was Germany's master race principle. This was all asserted under Walter Dare, the Minister of Agriculture. Volksgemeinschaft was defined as the socialism of the deed. Volksgemeinschaft saw many organisations being imposed, such as uh, in, <coughs> imposed, I'm losing my voice, winter health. This programme was for collecting money, food, clothes for families who had suffered from mass unemployment. So it's basically the idea of rich helping the poor, it's a good example of social conformity. Eintoff was one pot, the meal was sacrificed for the Reich. For families once a month during winter to have only one dish for Sunday lunch um, and that basically all the money they would save would be collected uh, by collectors that came to the door. Uh, so paid the SPD in exile suggested that the Volksgemeinschaft actually gave quite mixed results, whilst the economist C.W. Gilboard suggests that the Volksgemeinschaft particularly appealed to the unemployed as it was seen as an acceptable form of socialism. Volksgemeinschaft implied that every pure German could achieve equality or achieve anything regardless of their background. Recent work suggests that the propaganda of Volksgemeinschaft actually failed to break down class and social divisions. So in Ian Kershaw's analysis of Bavaria, he says that the Volksgemeinschaft actually failed to change the behavioural patterns. So Volksgemeinschaft was not actually an astronomical success. For example, the industrial working class was singled out as resistant to propaganda, um, as Tim Mason, the historian, suggests. And ultimately, the Nazis tried to sell Volksgemeinschaft through posters and films advertising the victory of the battle for work and Hitler was portrayed as the first worker of the nation, with May Day being transformed into the day of National, national Day of Labour. Ultimately, Volksgemeinschaft, as a result, in terms of propaganda, failed to achieve its revolutionary goals of destroying uh, class and religious loyalties. So it's not an immediate success. But if the propaganda focused on the idea of put the community before the individual, one people, one Reich, one Führer, of the propaganda slogans used. <coughs> Now we're going to look at uh, Nazi's racial policies. Uh, so Hitler's anti-Semitism anti uh, formed the fundamentals of his worldview, world tension. The reason why Hitler was anti-Semitic was he believed that the Jews in government under the Weimar period, uh, um, sorry, in the First World War, had actually been responsible for Germany losing the First World War. They believed that they had been uh, uh, basically let down by Jewish politicians and also they blamed the 1929 Wall Street crash uh, for Jews because many Jews actually worked in finance and banking. So I believe it was all caused, all the problems that Germany ever faced were caused due to the Jewish minority. 
and the problems of anti-Semitism had actually gone as far back to the Bergfried, which is the idea of the spirit of 1914, when Germany was actually united in support for the war. Hitler was in Mein Kampf, he describes the Jew as the personification of the devil, and quote the personification of the devil, unquote. Jews were excluded from Volksgemeinschaft, they were seen as an, Ari an inferior uh, race to the Aryan race, and a Jewish sh shop boycott was orchestrated on the 1st of April 1933, where SA members were outside of the Jewish shops and encouraged Germans to shop elsewhere. The boycott was unsuccessful as it only lasted one day. Hitler knew it was important to tone down his anti-Semitism in the early 30s as he was trying to secure chancellorship, so this meant he had to rein in the violence of the SA, who actually were disliked by the Germans, um, and he, so he wanted to keep their support. Under Hindenburg, the April Civil, April Civil Service Law was imposed, which purged Jewish civil servants, but didn't include Jews that had fought in the First World War or had family that had died in the First World War. And following Hindenburg's death comes a turning point. Hitler focuses on greater amounts of radical policy. Uh, for example, the law for prevention of hereditary diseased offspring was imposed. This was all the compulsory sterilization of those born with hereditary conditions. So this could be hereditary deafness, hereditary blindness. 400,000 names were submitted, and by 80% of these cases, it would actually uh, result in sterilization. Um, <clears throat> Other examples can include the Nuremberg Rally, a speech delivered by Gerhard Wagner, Reich Doctors' leader, hinted that a new race policy was going to be imposed, which saw the Nuremberg Laws being imposed in 1935, which meant it was illegal for any German or Jew to marry or have any sexual relations. It was seen as biologically undesirable, and as well, this was imposed following the law uh, for the protection of German blood and German honour. Another example can be seen is Jews were no longer considered citizens and or seen as second-class citizens legally, and they were defined as subjects. Any German would be defined as a Jew if they had three Jewish grandparents, as it was very difficult for Nazis to define what is actually a Jew. So they came up with this policy that any Jew would be somebody who had actually had three Jewish grandparents, and a full Jew would be somebody who would be classified with three Jewish grandparents and married to a Jew. Although these policies actually complicated things, because you had thousands of these part-time Jews who were Michelin, uh, who didn't necessarily conform to all of the categories that they had initially said. Biologically inferior involved gypsies, Slavs, and Jews. Asocials involved your alcoholics, your tramps, your criminals, and your homosexual men. Um, the civil service law is imposed under Gleis Shaltang, um, which is the idea of removing Jews from posts, teachings, and courts. The Rice Citizen Act was imposed, which meant only a citizen right could be defined as somebody who's a pure Aryan descent or German kindred blood. Um, and Edmund Merz, a criminologist, suggested that the Nazis felt they had to deal with the Jews and refer to them as community aliens through things like Einsatzgruppen, which is where SS men would shoot down a ton of uh, Jews all lined up and, from, and they'd be shot down into these pits and these bodies would lie on top of one another. Um, and 1934, there was the creation of the People's Courts and this meant opponents of the Nazis would be charged with treason even if, and found guilty even if there was not enough evidence mounted against them. It was not just the Jews and political opponents though, who were targeted. Scott Sally, a historian, points out that the Nazis sterilised people of mixed race, uh, who they called Rhineland bastards, under the direction of Oregon Fishers, Hitler's leading race scientist. And back to the, hered the um, sterilisation and um, uh, killing of people who were born with hereditary uh, conditions. The film Eklag, meaning I accuse, was a propaganda film which gained support for the idea of mercy killings and killing and the start of a euthanasia program, killing those who are mentally handicapped or, uh, as I said, disabled. And doctors started to accept this, although the euthanasia program was opposed by, by Bishop Galen of Münster, who delivered a sermon. Um, this is some additional information to point out. Uh, this is just a long list of other things that might be useful to know. Um, so churches, you have the Catholic Church with the Concordat 1933, Protestant, Protestantism, in 1933, Protestants agreed to unite to form a Reich Church, electing a Nazi as their Reich Bishop. In opposition, a group of Protestant pastors led by Martin Niemler and Dietrich Bonhoeffer set up a confessional church in opposition to Hitler's Reich Church. Youth, Nazi youth organisations led by Paul von Schirach, an emphasis on biology, history, PE and eugenics. Girls focused on League of German Maidens and focused on motherhood. Boys at the Hitler Youth focused on military training. A subject of Rasenkund focused on the Nazi views of hereditary and racial purity. Propaganda, The Triumph of Will, 1933, was a Nazi party rally, a Nuremberg filmed by Lenny Reichstaffel. Agriculture, Wadadare took control of the Reich's food estate and blood and soil ideology was imposed. Standards of living, wages working conditions had actually improved after 1933 under the Chancellor of Hitler, and Nazis provided better old age pensions and national health insurance. 
the role of women changed, women were expected to leave work and go back to their natural roles of mothers and wives and have lots of Aryan children. And German mothers' crosses would be awarded for how many children they would have. Uh, four being bronze, six being silver, and gold being eight children. And the ten uh, would actually get to meet, uh, uh, name Hitler, I uh, believe, or, uh, uh, yes. Um, and 1936, over 30 percent more births were present, prevalent than there had been in 1933. Some other propaganda films are important to know are films like Pedersen and Bendel in 1933, which drew on anti-Semitic stereotypes. Bendel is seen as a Jew and is seen as devious, and other films involved that he would Jew. <coughs> So that is absolutely everything uh, from Depth Study 5 on A New Right from 1933 to 1935. So we uh, covered everything that is mentioned in the textbook and also additional reading resources, which I've basically converted together into one 45-minute um, lecture. Thank you.